there is only one reaction which is fit to meet unprovoked aggression upon one's own sovereign territory. And that is the direct and unqualified and immediate, not merely willingness, but willingness expressed by action uh, to use force. The government have set in train the measures which will enable them to do that. But there must be nothing which casts doubt upon their will and their, in and their intention to do that. If this was a covert deployment, which I believe it was, uh, it could not have deterred if its presence was not known. Uh, and even if it, and even if the force, even if the size of the force had been deterred, even if the size of the force had been revealed, then it could have prevented, it could have provided nothing more than a tripwire uh, of exactly the same kind, provided by endurance and provided by the Royal Marine Garrison on, on Port Stanley. No, I can't. When the right honourable gentleman is trying to say there's some difference of opinions about this, but it was clearly stated by my right honourable friend, when the fact became known without fuss and publicity, right. and it had a success. That's the difference. 1977 was a success. This is a terrible failure. Well, uh, I, I don't think that uh, one is able to draw that conclusion. <laughs> Honourable gentlemen, as Secretary of State for Defence has not understood the value for a foreign secretary of being able to negotiate in a position of some military influence and strength, then he ought not to be Secretary of State. Yeah. In the course of its duties within the total exclusion zone around the Falkland Islands, HMS Sheffield, a Type 42 destroyer, was attacked and hit late this afternoon by an Argentine missile. The ship caught fire, which spread out of control. The order was then given to abandon ship. There were accompanying vessels in the immediate area, which picked up those who, who had abandoned ship. Nearly all the ship's company and the captain are accounted for. However, I, however, I regret to say that initial indications are that 12 men are missing and there are likely to be other casualties. Communications with the operational area are difficult at present and this information must be treated as provisional until further reports are received. Next of kin will of course be informed first as soon as full details are received. After successful attacks last night, General Moore decided to press forward. The Argentinians retreated. Our forces reached the outskirts of Port Stanley. Large numbers of Argentine soldiers threw down their weapons. They are reported to be flying white flags over Port Stanley. <laughs> Our troops have been ordered not to fire except in self-defense. Talks are now in progress between General Menendez and our Deputy Commander, Brigadier Waters, about the surrender of the Argentine forces on East and West Falkland. Yeah. I will report further to the House tomorrow. Yeah. Further to that uh, point of order, Mr. Speaker, may I first of all thank the Right Honourable Lady for coming to the House to give us the news, particularly because the news is so good for all concerned, especially, especially good because it does appear well, that what she has been able to tell us means that there will be an end of the bloodshed, which is what we have all desired, and I believe that... Uh, widespread, genuine 
rejoicing, to use the word that the Right Honourable Lady once used, but there will be genuine rejoicing at the prospect of the end of the bloodshed. I have to report to the House that a man was arrested in Buckingham Palace on Friday morning after entering the bedroom of Her Majesty the Queen. The House will admire the calm way in which Her Majesty responded to what occurred. It will also share my grave concern and that of the Commissioner of the Metropolis at this most serious failure in security arrangements. A man appeared in court on Saturday, having been charged in connection with an earlier incident at the Palace. I understand that the facts have been reported to the Director of Public Prosecutions, who is considering the possibility of charges arising out of the latest incident. Those of your Lordships who have longish memories may perhaps recollect an interview which I gave on the night on which I resigned. In the course of that interview, I said that given the information that we had at that time, I did not believe that the government or I had mishandled the situation or that we should have done differently. Nine months later, and with the benefit of the Franks Committee, I do not really honestly think that I can say that I would have done anything of substance differently. But, my lords, there was an undeniable feeling in this country that Britain's honour and dignity had been affronted. The governor of a British territory had been forcibly removed. An alien flag had been raised over an occupied population. And the widespread sense of outrage and impotence was understandable. And I was at the head of the Foreign Office. It did not seem to me a time for self-justification and certainly not to cling to office. I think that the country is more important than oneself. Assuming that the forecasts of inflation are reasonable, and I know that we've been wrong about the forecast of inflation for a very long time, even if inflation were to go up a bit in the coming months, we in fact, even if inflation, even if price increases were to go up a little bit in the year, uh, oh, the right honourable gentleman's afraid of an election, is he? Afraid! Right now, inflation is lower than it has been for 13 years, a record the right honourable gentleman couldn't begin to touch. Despite all our human frailties, this House is still Britain's bastion for democracy. It is here, in this chamber, and in the Parliament as a whole that the liberties of our people must be protected. We are a great parliamentary democracy, and I trust that this House will ever protect the values which brought greatness to our history. My heart will be with you all, and I shall never forget the steadfast support and friendship which I have received from both sides of this House, and which is reflected in the early day motion on the order paper today, for which I express deep gratitude. So I conclude. God bless you all. God bless this House and our country, that we may always cherish the heritage of freedom handed to us by our fathers. Thank you for the privilege of serving as your speaker. First, Mr. Speaker, I beg to move that the thanks of this House be given to Mr. Speaker for what he has said this day to the House, and that the same be entered in the journals of this House. Is the motion just proposed by the Prime Minister? As many as are that to can say aye. Aye. the country, no. I would have taken a poor view. <laughs> I think the eyes. My service in this house is very much less than many right honourable and other honourable gentlemen. Nevertheless, on this, the opening day of a new parliament, I am acutely aware of my feelings 
in October 1964. Uh -huh. I was so frightened, I must tell the House, that I spent most of it locked away in a room not a million miles from this chamber. <laughs> and uh, my confidence was not increased when I heard a familiar voice say to one of his friends, I don't know what this place is coming to, Tom. They've got my tailor in here now. <laughs> equally modest background and who may be feeling much the same way as I did on that occasion, that we are all equal here. Yeah. It is the human qualities and the character of honourable members which are rated and will earn the respect of this House. It was an honour to serve as Foreign and Commonwealth Secretary. I had hoped for the opportunity to continue serving the country and the government in that capacity, and indeed I expected to do so. But instead I was abruptly dismissed. As some of my right honourable and honourable friends know, and some others in the House know, that is an acutely hurtful experience. All the more so in the light of press speculation, which if not deliberately inspired, was remarkably well informed. So, in my case, it was as much the manner of the event as the event itself which bruised me. And I say this to the House today, so that my silence should not be mistaken for indifference. And by expressing my feelings this once, there is no more to be said about it, and I will not allow what has happened to colour my approach to the future. I now summarise the provisions of the draft order as laid before the House on the 6th of July. Inevitably, I will have to go into some technical legal language in this summary. <laughs> I hope the House will bear with me, and um, in deference to the expressed wishes of my honourable friend, I will accelerate the pace at which this particular passage is delivered. <laughs> The draft contains regulations which provide that a woman is entitled to equal pay with a man in the same employment, or a man with a woman, where her work is of equal value to a man's in terms of the demands made on her, for instance, under such headings as effort, skill and decision, paragraph 2.1. Where a claim for equal pay is to be determined under the new equal value provision, a tribunal will be able to dismiss an application if it is satisfied that there are no reasonable grounds for determining that the jobs are of equal value, paragraph 3.1. I've read in the newspapers that one is not allowed in this House to accuse another member of not being sober. But I very seriously put it to you that the Minister is incapable and that it is disrespect. It is a disrespect to this House and to the office he holds to come here and be. Order! Order! The Honourable Lady ought not to make allegations of that kind. Should withdraw. The Honourable Lady should withdraw the allegation. Order! 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 The, the honour Order! The Honourable Lady should withdraw the allegation. We're asking to withdraw from the chamber. I must ask me. I, I, I mean, I mean what I say, but I don't understand the rules of this House, and I'd be grateful for your advice about how I say to this House that I mean it, but I'm allowed to not, to not be penalised for saying it. On the 31st of October, this House reaffirmed by a majority of 144 its support for the NATO 1979 twin-track decision on intermediate-range nuclear forces. Its backing for the West's efforts to achieve a balanced and verifiable agreement at the Geneva negotiations. 
and confirmed that in the absence of agreement on the zero option, cruise missiles must be operationally deployed in the United Kingdom at the end of 1983. In the course of that debate, I indicated that the initial supporting equipment for the first flight of cruise missiles had been arriving at RAF Greenham Common for some time, that further equipment, including the transporter erector launchers, would be arriving shortly, and that I would make a further statement when the missiles themselves arrived in this country. In honouring that commitment, I should inform the House that earlier today, the first cruise missiles were delivered by air to <laughs> Under these new conditions, staff will be permitted in future to belong only to a departmental staff association approved by their director. The very special nature of the work of GCHQ will be apparent from what I've said. The action which I've taken stems directly from that. The government fully respects the right of civil servants to be members of a trade union, and it is only the special nature of the work of the GCHQ which has led us to take these measures. I can assure the House, therefore, that it is not our intention to introduce similar measures outside the field of security and intelligence. GCHQ staff are being informed of these measures this afternoon. Those who decide to remain at GCHQ will each receive a payment of £1,000 in recognition of the fact that certain rights which they have hitherto enjoyed are being withdrawn from them in the interest of national security. Those who do not wish to continue to serve at GCHQ will be offered the opportunity of seeking a transfer to another part of the civil service. I haven't wasted time on the Foreign Secretary this afternoon, although I'm bound to say that I feel some of his colleagues must be a bit tired by now of him hobbling round from one of their doorsteps to another with a bleeding hole in his foot and a smoking gun in his hand <laughs> and telling them that he didn't know it was loaded. But, Mr. Speaker, the Foreign Secretary is not the real villain in this case. He's the fall guy. Those of, you with, uh, those of us with long memories will feel he's rather like poor Van der Lubbe in the Reichstag fire trial. And we're asking ourselves, as was asked at that trial, who is the Mephistopheles behind this shabby Faust? <laughs> well, one more hour, one more the, answer, one more hour. the answer to that is clear enough. To quote her own backbenchers, the great she elephant. <laughs> she who must be obeyed. The Catherine the Great of Finchley. <laughs> the Prime Minister herself. It is her handling of this decision which has drawn sympathetic trade unionists like Len Murray into open revolt. It is her pig-headed bigotry which has prevented her closest colleagues and Sir Robert Armstrong from offering and accepting a compromise on this matter. Now, if I may say this to the Right Honourable Lady, for whom I have a great personal affection. <laughs> she has formidable qualities. She has a powerful intelligence and immense courage. But those are qualities that can turn into horrendous vices unless they are moderated by colleagues who have more experience, more understanding, and more sensitivity. And she's got rid of all those colleagues. There's nobody left in the cabinet who has both the courage and the ability to argue with her. I share the national sense of anger at the tragic death of a young policewoman and at the gross abuse of diplomatic immunities which caused it. We have made every effort to resolve matters peacefully and by mutual agreement. The attitude of the Libyan authorities has made it impossible for normal relations to continue. We shall continue as we have throughout 
to observe scrupulously our obligations under the Vienna Convention. But what has occurred clearly raises serious questions as to the adequacy of the Convention, its operation and enforceability. My right honourable friend, the Foreign and Commonwealth Secretary, will now review these matters and consider whether to put forward proposals for changes in the international community. Honourable members will appreciate that until the Libyans who are going have gone and British Embassy staff in Libya return home, the situation remains delicate. But we could not conceivably countenance with equanimity the outrage that we witnessed in London last week. We are responding to it firmly, but in accordance with international law. Libya, for its part, must now accept its clear responsibility for the protection and safe return of our staff in the British Embassy and their families. And indeed, that is all I have endeavoured to do. And if I may say so, I never sought to impose my views on other people. Rather, prefer to listen to what they had to say and debate the matter with them and to prove just this, that perhaps I was a more effective debater than they were. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes that happened, usually by accident. Or perhaps there was an audience behind me. Ah, that tells often. Nothing like having an audience behind you. <laughs> I must confess, it's easier to get an audience behind you on the government side than the opposition side. <laughs> we have the views about people. And some of them are better not be reached However, let me say, it is highly embarrassing to have one's record retailed in public. <laughs> in general, yes, but not in detail. <laughs> and I detect some of the implications. And I remember what they would say, but they are particularly generous this afternoon, so anxious to see reveal their compassion and for an old dodger who's past his time, is there, I think, not there anything new to say? Oh, don't be so sure about that. <laughs> Total security is impossible in a free democratic society. Political and other leaders are vulnerable because they must be accessible. Everything which can be done will be done to prevent such outrages and to protect their targets. But we will not be bombed into bolt holes by terrorists. Those who believe that terror can prevail against democracy understand neither the members of this House nor the British people. This was a deliberate attempt to destroy a government by mass murder. Yes, that government is a conservative government with which we have the most serious differences. But it is a democratically elected government. It is the British government. And let it be said in the plainest terms, the only way we get rid of a government in Britain is by the ballot box. Yeah. Terrorism and assassination have no place whatever in the political process in this country. We utterly and unanimously reject them. And we will fight with every fibre of our being against them. With Voltaire, we on this side say to the government, we disapprove of what you say, but we will defend to the death your right to say it. I'm also conscious, uh, Mr. Speaker, that I speak today from the junior ranks at the back benches. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Many of us in these... Uh, in these circumstances, feel as nervous amateurs, to, amateurs compared to the professionalism of the front benches. <laughs> we can only, com we can only com comfort ourselves, Mr. Speaker, with the knowledge that while the Ark was built by amateurs, it was professionals who built the Titanic. <laughs> <laughs> I can't interfere with anything my age. What is happening in our country today? This terrible strike of the best men in the world who beat the Kaiser's army and beat Hitler's army and never give in. Pointless, endless. But we can't afford that kind of thing. And then this growing division which the noble lord has just spoken mentioned of a comparatively prosperous South and an ailing 
North and Midlands. That can't go on. Then the sort of general sense of tension. The people, instead of the old English way, they might quarrel and have battles, we had plenty. The old lords were around me now, so we had plenty of rows and battles, but they were friendly. They were in the old way. It's a new kind of, I can only describe it as wicked hatred that has brought in among different types of people. That can go. Well, if we to do this, it's not merely, as I say, an intellectual, but a model effort. But if we do, then although I'm only, and I'm so old, I can only hope to see the first gleams that precede the dawn. I know that the generations that have come will see the bright sunlight of the day. And if they replace some of these dreadful, wicked systems that have crept into our life, if we abandon cynicism and criticism and hatred for each other, if we take up the great theme that St. Paul has given us forever, more, rely more on faith, hope, and charity above all charity. Then, my lords, I see these young men and women from every home in England setting out with confidence on a new phase in the long road which we call man's pilgrimage here on earth. Order. I say to those members who are standing in front of the table that this statement was specially asked for by the opposition and the House has a right to hear it. So I ask, I ask those honourable members and those honourable members who are standing by the mace, please resume, resume their seats. Order. I, order. Order. This, this is a place where we argue out our differ differences, and this kind of behaviour is quite intolerable. Order. Order. I order. Order. I'm not prepared to have a, an argument by from honourable gentlemen standing at the table. Now, I give them. I appeal once more. The statement was order. The statement was order. This statement was asked for by the opposition, and in my discretion, I granted it. And I'm asking the honourable members now to resume their seats. The House now stands adjourned. Do United States servicemen come under the same British law as, as, as British servicemen, or do they come under the Visiting Forces Act? I tell the noble lord that I have not heard his question. <laughs> Do American servicemen come under the Visiting Forces Act or under British law? Let the noble lord be no more heard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let the noble lord be no longer heard. As many as are of that opinion will say content. Yeah. The contrary, not content. Yeah. Clear the bar. Uh, a gentleman who, for reasons of chivalry I will not mention, but who op occupies grand office and had taken grandly of wine, therefore, as wine does, allowed Veritas to overcome him. So he went up to the Prime Minister in words which I will not use, and he said to her <clears throat> that he had always fancied her. To which the Prime Minister replied, Quite right, you have very good taste, but I just don't think you'd make it at the moment. <laughs> now, would that have been an offence under Section 3? It would. 
And then at last, and then finally, you know, the latest refuge or the last refuge of all, we've got it in the motion, protection of the armed forces. It wasn't here, here. We all agree with that. But it was not protection of the armed forces. It was the protection of ministers. Ministers at various times over the two or three years had misled the House about the date of the detection of the Belgrano, about the course on which it was sailing, when it was sunk, and 11 hours before it was sunk, <coughs> about the changes of course of the Belgrano. It had, in fact, refused to answer legitimate questions where there were no questions of national security involved, and, of course, it did not give full and frank information to the Select Committee. It was all about the protection of ministers, the protection of the reputation of ministers and the protection of the reputation yeah, yeah, of the Prime Minister yeah, herself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let us do the decent thing by our rainmakers. Since 1975, and with a little help from the Prime Minister, they have changed the political agenda. And just let me give you a brief list of simple truths. These, this is the old agenda upon which we fought and won two elections. One, Public spending is bad. Two, civil servants are idle. Three, waste is rife. Four, you must suffer. Five, moaning minis must get on their bikes. Six, state benefits are far too high. Seven, there is no alternative to present economic policies. And eight, pull up your socks. <laughs> No wonder, Mr. Speaker, we are unloved. <laughs> but, <laughs> but our, <laughs> our new rainmakers have concocted a new agenda. And let me read out the items of the new agenda. One, public spending is good. <laughs> All those new hospitals. Two, you have not suffered. <laughs> Three, we care. Four, we will cut income tax. Nigel says so. Five, we will even cut unemployment. And Nigel says so as well. We will give you new laws and hopefully more order. And I wait for it. Mrs. T loves you after all. <laughs> we will do away with rates, but not yet. <laughs> and we can perform the five-card trick. When I ventured to criticise the other day this system, I was, I'm afraid, misunderstood. As a Conservative, I'm naturally in favour of returning into private ownership and private management all those means of production and distribution which are now controlled by a state capitalist. I'm sure they will be more efficient. What I ventured to question was the using of these huge sums as if they were income. I know now, I've learnt now from the letters that I've received that I'm quite out of date. <laughs> modern, <laughs> modern economists have decided there is no difference between capital and income. I'm not so sure. In my younger days, I and perhaps others of your lordships had friends, good friends, very good fellows indeed too, who failed to make this distinction. <laughs> For a few years, everything went on very well. <laughs> And then at last the crash came, and uh, they were forced to retire out of some dingy lodging house in Boulogne, or the estate were larger and the trustees more generous to a decent accommodation at Baden-Baden. <laughs> <laughs> does the Right Honourable Lady understand if she does not yet understand, she soon will. That the penalty for treachery is to fall into public contempt. Mr. Speaker, 
I think the right honourable gentleman will also understand that I find his remarks deeply offensive. Yeah. And I went to Hillsborough on the Friday morning, despite the obstacles put in my way by the Northern Ireland office, despite the obstacles put in my way by the headquarters of the RUC, despite the divisional commander's obstacles in Lisburn, despite the obstacles put in the way by the police commander in Hillsborough, and I stood in Hillsborough not waving a Union Jack, I doubt if I'll ever wave one again, not singing uh, hymns, not saying prayers, not protesting. I stood outside the gates of Hillsborough like a dog and asked them to put in my hand the document which sold away my birthright. They told me they would give it to me as soon as possible. Having never consulted me, having never sought my opinion, having never asked my advice, they told the rest of the world what was in store for me. And I stood in the cold outside the gates of Hillsborough Castle and waited for them to come out and give me the agreement second hand. And you know what's even more despicable, Mr. Deputy Speaker? They couldn't even send one of their servants to give it to me. He told me three hours before, yes, he would bring it out to me. And at a quarter to three, 15 minutes after the press conference had begun, I told the policeman, would you mind going in and asking me for uh, the declaration that they have betrayed everything I've ever stood for? And a senior police officer had to go into Hillsborough House, ask for the document and bring it out and, and, and give it to me. And if you want to know why I felt desolate, I felt desolate for this reason, that as I stood in the cold in the square of Hillsborough, everything I'd ever held dear turned to ashes in my mouth. Everything. 